was from Silicon Valley, California's high-tech center, where he founded an electronics company, System Industries, in 1968. By 1982, when he left his position as president of System Industries to run for Congress, the company which manufactures disk memory systems from many computers employed 550 people and had annual sales of $60 million. Prior to founding Systems Industries, he was an assistant professor at Stanford Graduate School of Business and a Harvard Business School. He received an A.B. in philosophy, math, and physics from Princeton University, attended Stanford University, and a Ph.D. in business administration. In 1978, he chaired the Capital Formation Task Force of the American Electronics Association, which proposed a legislative initiative resulting in reduction of capital gains taxes. He has testified on behalf of legislation to encourage high technology innovation, small business, and economic growth. He is a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and a chairman of the Task Force on High Technology Initiatives for the Search Committee of the House Republican Conference. I've heard Congressman Shaw speak before. I think you'll find it very interesting and very stimulating. Congressman Shaw. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. <clears throat> and I hadn't, over the last year, thought very much about my former life uh, as a uh, president of a high technology company, but thinking back, it was just three years ago this month that I gathered my employees together in our manufacturing area and dropped the bombshell on them. I uh, announced to them that I was, after 15 years as president of the company and founder of the company, was planning to leave System Industries to run for Congress. I recall going home that night and looking in the Wall Street Journal, paging through, and uh, looked at the stock of System Industries in the over-the-counter listings. We'd gone public about six months before at a $16 a share offering price, and uh, that evening I noticed that the price was still $16 a share. Not much had happened. But within 90 days after the news reached the market that I was leaving the presidency of System Industries, the price soared to $46 a share. <laughs> Shareholders came up to me at the annual meeting and said, you've made a lot of bum decisions in your life, Shao, but this last one you made has been the best one you've ever made for us <laughs> shareholders. Well, I came here to uh, Congress a year ago uh, and I was delighted to see the interest that there was in high technology. Right after I arrived, President Reagan made his State of the Union message in which he announced the commitment of his administration to maintain U.S. technological leadership for the future. Uh, within uh, the first months of uh, my first year here, there were more than 100 bills introduced uh, purporting to do something for or to high technology. There were the Atari Democrats that were uh, forming, uh, talking about high technology while they frantically searched for a new name. Uh, when, I, uh, when I formed the uh, organization that was referred to the Republican Task Force on High Technology, 138 of the 167 lonely Republicans in the House joined this task force. So there was no lack of enthusiasm for people to jump on the high technology technology bandwagon. Uh, all of this I saw with mixed emotions. Uh, I was delighted that there was so much interest in perpetuating that factor in our society that's contributed so much to our economic development. But on the other hand, whenever you have a hot political topic, there are two bad things that happen. One, there's over-expectation, over-promising. Some people said that what we should do is put all of our resources into high tech, and let's forget about those old smokestack industries. It, it almost makes you nauseous to think about them. Uh, that, uh, that's where the growth in this country is going to come from, not realizing that although high technology has created a lot of jobs in this country and its growth potential is enormous, it's still a small part of the overall economic scene, and uh, the two million jobs that we expect to come out of the high technology industries in the uh, next five years would be a drop in the bucket to the jobs that would be lost if we allowed all of our more mature industries to atrophy. Rather than allowing them to atrophy, we should rejuvenate them by applying new techniques, and technology has a role to play there. 
The other bad thing that happens when you have a hot political topic is a lot of bum ideas get suggested as to what to do, and many of them get passed. We have, for example, people here in Washington that say what we should do in order to make sure we maintain our technological leadership is to form some sort of high technology planning board that would have offices maybe over in Crystal City and they would determine uh, where the future of this country lies and where the technologies uh, uh, with the greatest opportunities would be and then channel taxpayer money into promoting those specific technologies. Having had to go through the product planning job myself and having made many, many mistakes uh, in the process, I know how difficult it is for those who are on the firing line, the engineers who have to make the, the detailed technical decisions, the uh, managing engineers that have to choose the projects and the presidents of companies that are involved in the industries. It's hard enough for those in uh, with first-hand contact to make those decisions, but to think that some bureaucracy of the government is going to be better able to do it, uh, does, it doesn't reflect a, an understanding of the difficulty of the problem. And yet, on the other hand, we can't say government has no role to play in our technological future. That would uh, ignore the fact that our procurement policy, our science policy, our tax policy, our trade policies, all of those impact whether or not we're going to be successful as a technological leader for the future. So it seems to me that what we should do is define what the proper role of government is. And to my way of thinking, it's a targeting of a somewhat different kind that, that's been proposed in the past. Rather than targeting on specific industries or targeting on specific technologies, I believe the proper role of the federal government is to target on the process by which technological development and new ideas are developed. The process of innovation, that is, the government's role is to create an environment in this country in which new ideas, inventions, technological developments are likely to flourish. Having said that, I think it's important to identify what the prerequisites to such an environment are. Let me go through them briefly. At least this is the prerequisites based on my uh, experience, and you may have some other ideas. First of all, a deep and abiding commitment to basic research in this country. Year in, year out, whether there are good years or bad years, we've got to be supporting the basic research that will provide the foundations for future technologies and future products, the kind of research that's not usually done in the private sector because it's too far out, it's uh, too risky. Uh, the basic research to understand how the world works, the kind of research into DNA, for example, that then provided the foundations for the genetic engineering industry, the sort of research done at colleges and universities and research institutes where you not only get the benefit of the research, but you also get the benefit of training people to do research for uh, the, the later uh, future research as well as uh, resources, human resources for teaching. In addition to that deep abiding commitment and, and funding of basic research by the federal government, there's other things that can be done to promote research in this country. Uh, in the House and Senate today, there's legislation which I think will be passed this year to modify our antitrust laws so that corporations can join together to share their scarce research resources per, to pursue projects that might be too risky or too expensive for any single corporation to pursue alone. Uh, the formation of such research and development joint ventures has been uh, subject to the possibility of antitrust attack in the past because of the way that the laws are written and because of the proclivity of our uh, lawyers in this country to seek the treble damages uh, where they might exist. But if we modify the antitrust laws to make the formation of such R&D joint ventures not a per se violation of antitrust law, but rather evaluate such 
uh, ventures uh, depending upon their competitive aspects and reduce the potential damages from treble damages to actual damages, we can reduce the risk of forming such R&D joint ventures and stimulate not only our high technology companies to form uh, programs to, uh, to explore the cutting edge of technology, but also encourage our uh, more mature industries, steel industries, automobile industries, to share their research resources to develop new processes and products that will make them more competitive in world as well as domestic markets. In addition to a commitment to basic research, we've got to recognize that new technologies, innovation doesn't come risk-free. We need incentives for the risk takers. The reduction of the capital gains tax stimulated venture capital to fund many new startup companies in the high technology field. Maybe some of your companies have benefited from that. Uh, we want to make permanent the R&D tax credit so that uh, corporations can uh, uh, be motivated to devote more of their dollars to risky R&D projects. We want to make sure that our patent laws and our copyright laws give adequate protection to the results of research so that pirating doesn't take place and uh, reduce substantially the incentives for people to take the kind of risks associated with the development of new semiconductors, uh, for example, or new uh, production processes. We need to have these sorts of incentives for the risk takers. In addition to commitment to basic research, incentives for the risk takers, we need the people to do the work. I'm sure you've heard discussion and your organization is focused on the problem of making sure that we have adequate supply of trained technical people. And yet, uh, according to the American Electronics Association at any rate, over the next five years, the shortfall between the requirements for electrical engineers and computer scientists will be about 90,000, the difference between the requirements and the numbers being turned out by our college and university engineering departments. Now, now the uh, Japanese are, are better than we are on a per capita basis in this regard. They're turning out about twice as many engineers per capita as we are, but we have the Japanese beat uh, from here to Sunday when it comes to lawyers and accountants. For every 10,000 people in the United States, we have 20 lawyers and 40 accountants. Whereas the poor Japanese, they only have one lawyer and three accountants for every 10,000 people in their country. I don't see how they get along. But when it comes to engineers, they're turning out twice as many per capita as we are. What is there to do? Well, I think that the private sector has an intense interest in this. Uh, those of us who've had experience in Silicon Valley know the futility of just hiring from one another when there's a scarcity of supply. We uh, have a, a, a real interest in making sure that the capacity of our college and university engineering departments are increased, but that takes money. There are currently 2,000 faculty openings, I'm told, in college and university engineering departments. Uh, the private sector can make contributions, has been making contributions. I'm supporting legislation to enhance the tax incentives for such private sector contributions of cash or equipment to college and university engineering departments, as well as encouraging contributions to uh, pri primary and secondary schools of computer equipment so that we can uh, provide a basis for science and math education in this country. Well, in addition to a commitment to basic research, incentives for the risk takers, and adequate supply of trained technical people, we've got to have adequate market opportunities as well. People aren't going to take the risks associated with technological development if there's nothing in it for them. And what that means is a healthy domestic economy and uh, access to foreign markets. In trade policy, we've got to get tougher. We've got to insist on uh, fair trade as well as free trade. We've got to break down the trading barriers that have long, long existed in other countries. We have to make sure that our export controls, which are uh, designed to permit 
prevent technology from uh, reaching the hands of our potential adversaries to make sure that those export controls are balanced so that uh, we're not impeding needlessly the ability of our uh, companies to compete in foreign markets. And uh, finally, I think we should make sure that we have adequate incentives for S exports. The tax incentive that has long existed, the domestic international sales corporation, has to be reinstated in some way to make it compatible with our uh, generally accepted uh, trade agreements so that we can provide in not only incentives for small companies but means of uh, uh, those companies financing their exports in foreign markets. And finally, the domestic economy. I may look pretty young to you, but I hold old-fashioned ideas. And one of those old-fashioned ideas, I believe, is that deficits make a difference. That we are currently borrowing as a result of our desire to spend far more on you than we're willing to tax you. We're currently borrowing virtually every penny of private savings out of this country. Typically, the private savings in this country is 5% of GNP. Sometimes it goes a little higher. Currently, it's around 5%. We're currently borrowing to fund the deficit 5% of GNP. The only thing that's saving our lunch right now is foreign capital is coming in, state and local government are running surpluses, but if both of those went away, there'd be absolutely no money for buying houses, for buying cars, durable goods, for plants to expand, to create new jobs. I don't think we can wait until after the election. We have to take action this year in order to make a substantial reduction in the deficits that this country is facing. I introduced a resolution last year, uh, last, uh, yesterday just as a straw man to say that if we froze real growth in spending and and we uh, put a 5% surcharge on corporate and individual income. We would reduce in 1985 the deficit by $50 billion. We would create $50 billion more in that savings pool. And I think that as a result of such an emergency measure or something like that, we can allow the recovery to continue so that we can have time to deal with the more fundamental problems. Well, those are the thoughts that I have. What's the proper role of government? Don't try to pick winners and losers, target the process by which winners and losers are created, the process of innovation by making a commitment to basic research, by creating incentives for the risk takers, adequate supply of trained technical people, ample market opportunities. Now, the concept behind this, the fundamental behind what I've just said, is the debate between whose responsibility is it? for maintaining our technological leadership. Some would say it's the federal government's responsibility. The government is responsible for that. My feeling is that the responsibility for maintaining our technological leadership is with you, with the, the some quarter of a million engineers, with the entrepreneurs, with the people who are willing to take the risks to innovate, to try new ideas. That's where our technological leadership comes from. And my feeling is that the best role of government is to create an environment in which you can do the job in the future that you've done so well in the past. I'm delighted to have had the chance to share these thoughts with you, and I'll look forward to hearing from uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Doug Waldron, on his thoughts on the same subject. Thank you very much. Well, the second speaker this morning is uh, Congressman Doug Walgren. First elected to the 95th Congress in 1976, Representative Walgren is a member of the House Science and Technology Committee, and he's chairman of its subcommittee on science, research, and technology. He is also a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee and its subcommittees on fossil and synthetic fuels, health and environment, and oversight and investigation. A graduate of Dartmouth College and Stanford Law School, Representative Waldron has been a corporate counsel and in private law practice prior to seeking public service. Congressman Waldron has been a good friend of the IEEE as president. I visited his office and his committee's office, subcommittee's office, and received a very fine reception. Last year, he took a trip down to Orlando to meet with the executive committee of the IEEE for a briefing on technological policy. He and I share one other thing. Uh, 
He's the father of twins, and so am I. Mine are a few decades older than his. But uh, I can tell you, it's, it's a real experience, and after the trauma, you really enjoy it. It's worthwhile. So I'd like to introduce to you uh, Representative Doug Walgren. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, my colleague Ed Chow from California, who brings to the Congress such a, uh, a wealth of experience in the private sector, in particular, and successful experience at that, and I think that uh, we all would do well to to uh, uh, to give great weight to the perspectives that he brings, uh, particularly in the area of uh, where this uh, economy can move, where it can go, uh, in the areas that, that industry is breaking new ground. And I think, uh, uh, just picking up from uh, where Ed left off, uh, clearly uh, uh, the responsibility, the responsibility really does lie with uh, the individuals, the citizens in this country. Uh, I think people in public life may differ uh, somewhat as to uh, how we see the role of government, uh, although we wouldn't want to put responsibility there, I think we all agree that, that in large measure uh, we're in this together. And in acting together, the government as a mechanism of acting together uh, is a very important instrument for putting certain pieces in place for what must happen in the private sector to be able to happen and to be able to happen at its fullest and to be able to happen at the earliest uh, possible moment. Uh, we know in the world today that it's possible to be passed by. And uh, I know in my area in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, we in the steel industry feel very much passed by. And, and we, uh, uh, we need to have the attention of government and the action of government in, in certain areas so that we don't go into such a decline that uh, a whole industry or a whole, whole communities in many ways are really irrevocably damaged. And, and uh, uh, so it is important that the government, uh, as us, uh, be there in many ways to help what uh, can only happen from individuals and from the private, sp pri 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 private sector happen. Uh, in the Congress, we are trying to be as helpful in, in, uh, in helping the economy change and to allow the new economic strengths to emerge as we can. As, as chairman of the Science, Research, and Technology Subcommittee on our overall Science and Technology <coughs> Committee, uh, I don't know that, that I bring anything special to that. Uh, perhaps a little bit of, uh, of contact with the area and an invitation uh, to you on an individual basis to, to know that, that, uh, that the Congress wants to respond to you wants to be able to, to incorporate and give as much weight as possible to the perspectives that you have. I think in many ways one of our greatest problems in this country is almost a, uh, the, the problem of the feeling that the individual doesn't matter. Well, the truth of it is we have very responsive institutions, and I want to extend to you a very direct invitation from that committee and from, from, from the other members on that committee to, to uh, uh, ask you to play a, a very individual role in, in uh, giving the government your guidance and your perspectives. We feel that we have <coughs> real problems. I suppose it's, it's uh, 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 historical. They are of large dimension. They won't be turned around in a day. Uh, when you look at the, the decline in research and development investment as a society as a whole, it's apparently true that you can say that we have declined since the 1960 measurements, the early 1960s. It's probably un not unusual, given the state of our economy, that that research and development investment has declined. Certainly in the late 50s uh, and through the 60s, we were literally uh, uh, resting on our market dominance in the world, and there was no real competition, and therefore no cutting edge of incentive to, in desperation in any event, to, to, uh, uh, to, to put substantial dollars towards uh, uh, the unknown. 
but uh, following that, uh, during the 70s, the rate of inflation was uh, so difficult for private entities to manage that literally all the funds were, were taken up on staying alive. And again, a period of 10 years or so where really there was a little ability to, uh, uh, to allocate real resources to, to the unknown, certainly to basic, even, uh, even applied research. So it isn't uh, surprising that as a measure of gross national product during those years that our investment uh, in that area went down. I do think we have to take, and, and everyone thinks we ought to take very clear measure of our comparisons with the rest of the world and realize that those other economies were doing just the reverse more aggressive uh, in this area, perhaps out of dire need in their circumstances, but they were really investing in uh, uh, basic research and development. And not only that, uh, they have much less of a uh, pull on their dollars that they can allocate in that area towards defense. In the United States, we allocate literally, I think it's something like half the governmental research and development budget towards defense. Uh, overall, it's one quarter, 25% of the total, and we are up against countries that are allocating 98% of their research and development dollars just towards economic, uh, uh, competitive economic functions, and, uh, and only spending 2% or 5% or something in that area on defense. Now, much good comes out of defense dollars, and they're very necessary, but whenever you you uh, allocate so much in that direction, you have to, I think, understand as a whole that we have to be compensating in other directions, putting in place some of the incentives that uh, Ed Zhao recommended and being sensitive in other areas about what's happening because if we hurt ourselves with one hand, we better be helping ourselves with the other so that we maintain the proper balance. We are kind of working on the margins, I think, in the in the uh, uh, legislative area. Uh, the macro issues that uh, Ed talked about, the deficits, uh, uh, the government's relationship to inflation, those I think probably uh, determine our circumstances much more than any of the individual programs that we put in place. But at the same time, uh, there are uh, areas that, uh, uh, that the Congress can uh, be specifically constructive. Uh, we uh, uh, have in our committee uh, tried to, to uh, hold hearings and, and increase discussion and in fact report legislation uh, that uh, some of which has become law and we haven't uh, noticed the millennium yet. Uh, the Stevenson-Weidler Act, which was passed a couple years ago, which was designed to try to access that uh, 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 substantial federal research dollar and be sure that the private sector had full uh, access to the ideas that were developed with, with, the, with the federal research dollar, and particularly in federal laboratories. Uh, that did become law. It suffered from a lack of, of pickup uh, on the personnel side, the resource side, but nonetheless it's there and the policy of the government is for the private sector to have access to the, the work product of those federal labs uh, and the federal research dollar. At the same time, we've tried to to uh, broaden the, the proprietary rights, uh, the, the, uh, the patent rights uh, that flow from federal research dollars. Tentatively at first, uh, providing that uh, if uh, small businesses or universities or nonprofit organizations uh, uh, who are doing contract work with tax dollars, if they come across a patentable idea, it's theirs, and they have a right to pursue it and develop it uh, with every expectation of the incentive and the return that, that we provide uh, 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 through the rest of the private sector. There is now proposals to broaden that to the large corporations. Uh, probably no reason not to, truthfully. The, uh, uh, we are finding that there is such a gap between the, the original uh, uh, basic research and the actual commercialization process that uh, you've got to have great incentives to pull through the investment and the time and the commitment necessary to, to uh, get through there. Uh, we differ in the Congress uh, in many ways on our uh, 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 
belief of, of, of how much applied research should the Congress uh, develop. In the energy area in particular, the, the present administration has taken an extremely uh, 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 philosophic approach that basic research is the only place we're going. Uh, and we do know that there is a great gap between the basic research and the demonstration because uh, even in the synthetic fuels area where we have a policy of, 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 as a national defense matter, of picking up and having a capacity for liquid fuels, even in that area we're only picking up what they call, quote, mature technologies. And, uh, uh, and the gap between the basic research, the lack of the ability to demonstrate that this is truly a mature, viable technology uh, means that there's very little pickup on the other end of that synthetic fuel effort of the government. And I think particularly in areas of, of, of great demonstrable human need uh, and economically energy uh, and, uh, uh, and food in this world overall, I think are, are, uh, are areas of, of, of tremendous human need that the government should not, at least as a matter of principle, shy away from doing the, the continuation of the demonstration effort in trying to give life to these ideas because when you see the droughts in the Sierra in, in, in the in in the Sahara and the the ability of uh, of, of uh, uh, agricultural breakthroughs and the use of water and the like and the, the the general need for energy around the world not only from our own perspective but from the perspective of developing countries uh, we ought to be demonstrating everything we can in the energy area so that we so so, so that there are the technologies in place before uh, uh, human suffering causes great political change. In any event, uh, uh, we are trying to work at the margins uh, in the committee. Uh, the, uh, uh, the patent bill is one uh, particular example. The, we do have some proposals on robotics where we want to encourage uh, uh, our country to get involved in automated manufacturing. Certainly we know that is the way of the future and some seed efforts on the part of the government uh, uh, cannot uh, be far off the mark. I think it's fair to say that the most powerful of which would be the tax breaks for business because uh, we know that that does drive the system. When we look back over the last several years, certainly the most uh, uh, powerful thing we've done has been the tax breaks for contributions to universities and the tax breaks for basic research. Uh, the tax code is in the warp and woof of the society, if that's the right word, and, and consequently pulls uh, uh, in ways that no specific program uh, can ever do. And in many ways, the programmatic approaches are really just uh, very isolated uh, 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 projects that uh, uh, are not uh, uh, present in, this, in the economy as a whole. But in any event, I think it is fair to say that on a macroeconomic level, these kinds of tax incentives are inconsistent with the position that we've been put in by the, the uh, tremendous escalation of the deficit in the last several years. Uh, uh, there is great push now to, to uh, uh, simplify the tax code. Uh, and when congressmen go to their districts, they are pushed very hard on flat tax, a feeling of unfairness in individuals. Uh, and, uh, uh, and there is uh, live proposals now of modified flat taxes uh, uh, that would create wide, simple ranges. And the whole contribution of corporations will very likely be swept up in that, uh, uh, that uh, effort. And I think we have to understand that in the mid-1950s, corporations contributed something like 24% of our federal effort, whatever it was. And uh, uh, we now are receiving from corporations something in the range of 8%. And the tax uh, structure it is now should reduce that percentage. And from an individual standpoint, uh, the workers uh, and middle-income people are sitting out there saying that they are paying a very heavy burden and wanting to see that uh, code simplified and wanting to, to see in that simplification an outreach for a fair contribution from every sector of the society that's possible to alleviate their burden. And I think it's fair to say that they will be looking at the corporations for that. And that is inconsistent with maintaining individual tax breaks such as the one that is 
so needed and done so much in this particular area of research and development. So those macro levels that Ed mentioned uh, have got to be addressed or we will lose certainly very valuable things. We also have in the jurisdiction of this subcommittee the National Science Foundation. The, uh, uh, in some ways, I'm tempted to say that the National Science Foundation is uh, only at the margins. We're talking about a billion, uh, 300 million. Uh, I used to know what percentage of the total uh, research uh, effort in the country that was. It's not a great total, it is a small total. I think the military is something like 40 billion and uh, then you have a number of the rest. So we're talking, you know, maybe uh, 2% or something like that of the total federal research dollar in the National Science Foundation and yet we have given them the overall mandate of being responsible for the health and vitality of our, uh, the state of our scientific knowledge. Uh, another case uh, on a programmatic basis of, of uh, very much underfunding uh, uh, something. And you can see the underfunding certainly within the system when you look at the individual programs. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Washington Post had yesterday the Nobel laureate saying that this country's got to put money behind its supercomputers. And, uh, 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 and the NSF had a uh, background uh, task force which uh, assessed the, the reasonable effort at something in the range of $200 million. And, and given the macro budget deficits, the uh, macro economic policies that we're functioning under and the difficulty of creating any new initiatives in the, uh, the uh, uh, frame we're in now, uh, uh, the NSF has come up with uh, a $20 million initiative. And the question is really whether uh, $20 million measures up to a $200 million need. And, uh, uh, and given the potential and the future of that uh, whole technology, shouldn't we be doing more? In the process of, of uh, uh, I think, uh, great credit uh, is to be given uh, the Congress uh, and uh, 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 the people that have become involved in the scientific area uh, in reversing what was the immediate thrust of the administration in coming on in 1981 with respect to science education. The initial thought was that the federal government had no role in education and that therefore science education and largely engineering education uh, as a derivative of that in, in the National Science Foundation was to be zeroed out. And in fact, that's what happened in the first uh, two years of the administration's budget. But the, the Washington being what it is, the Congress being the balance wheel that it is to the executive, and the needs being such, uh, that policy has been reversed by the administration, and they now uh, are proposing a, a, uh, a certainly, considering other programs, a balanced effort in science education through the National Science Foundation. And and, uh, uh, and derivatively in the engineering area, certainly recognizing that uh, engineering education is a, is a major part of that. This committee, this particular committee, uh, I think deserves some credit for leading the ground in that. Uh, last uh, uh, year we passed the Science and Math Education Act, which was an attempt to, to really bolster resources in that area. When you think of the, the state of education, the science education, and the future uh, uh, abilities of our people, uh, you cannot help but be struck by uh, our deficiencies. And uh, particularly when you measure it against what other countries are doing, they're different societies, but nonetheless, they put a much higher value on, on education, and particularly scientific education, than we do. Uh, when you measure us against other countries and what they are doing for all their students, and when you measure uh, the actual involvement of our students in scientific curriculum as they come through the, the, uh, the high schools and into college, uh, you can only be struck by our deficiencies. It is uh, uh, true, I think, that it is an area that can be addressed uh, with the kind of, of, uh, of, of social bootstrapping that we should have the ability to do. The educational system is one that can respond uh, uh, not only to dollars but to uh, a call to values. And in fact, a small investment of dollars, particularly on the federal level, can do wonders in providing uh, uh, stimulation and, and uh, 
uh, uh, and break the isolation that some of the high school teachers feel uh, when they go out there and spend years and years uh, simply teaching uh, the same course over and over again. Uh, the kinds of programs that we should be prepared to deliver through the National Science Foundation for not very large investment, uh, summer workshops, special recognition, uh, uh, pulling people out of the system and giving them a real uh, 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 shot in the arm uh, of new ideas and new approaches. These kinds of things can do wonders to, to revitalize the educational system. And certainly we ought to be prepared to do it in spades from the, from, from, from the federal level. I think you have to ask yourself, uh, we fund education for, by, the, by the most regressive tax in, that we have, the, flat, the, the uh, property tax. And uh, certainly where it's deficient, we ought to start to reach for whatever resource we have to add to that and make it happen. At the same time, uh, 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 in engineering, uh, both in the National Science Foundation budget and I think in the Congress, there is great uh, appreciation at this point of the difficulty in engineering education that we're having, particularly with respect to faculty uh, shortages and, and instrumentation shortages. And the National Science Foundation, as I'm sure others must have said, is targeting its programs, its research grants, uh, and the allocations within those grants to try to to uh, 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 to increase the instrumentation component of that, so that we will have in our schools uh, more up to date uh, uh, and and uh, useful instrumentation uh, for students. Uh, the National Science Foundation in engineering has been. Uh, 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 strengthened uh, by uh, substantial percentages. Uh, they are embarking on new programs uh, uh, that cut across uh, disciplinary lines, trying to establish some cross uh, disciplinary uh, engineering efforts. And uh, they certainly should only be encouraged in that process. Uh, some in the engineering community believe that we have to give engineering visibility, and particularly uh, ask for that visibility by uh, giving it equal standing with science on the national level. And they want to see a national science and engineering foundation. And I think that uh, there's certainly much to be said for the, the, uh, uh, the need for visibility, which is really, a, in a sense, a call to values and a, and, and a, a, a holding out of the, of the goals of, of uh, uh, the role that engineering has to play in our society. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, we ought to be strengthening programs uh, as much as we possibly can. I don't exactly look forward to a fight between the science community and the engineering community over, over visibility and standing. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the, the push in that direction should have all our attention. And clearly, uh, when you talk about in, uh, economic recovery, it's the engineers that are going to provide the recovery because they're the ones that provide the process engineering that actually employs people and, and, uh, and guides our economic efforts in the right direction. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. And I uh, want to, uh, uh, to again uh, repeat the invitation on an individual basis, on the level that individuals are really the ones that drive this society, uh, uh, to invite you as individuals to, to uh, relate to the Congress, relate to individual congressmen on a personal basis, and to, to uh, uh, approach the relevant committees of the Congress with, with uh, your experiences and, and, and your perspectives, because if this country is unable to respond individually, I think uh, uh, we can count on going downhill in the long run. But if our country is able, as a as a as a what we do together is able to respond to the individual input from people, then I think we can know that this is going to be a very bright future indeed. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Congressman Walden. Uh, we have about five minutes for questions, and I think it would be best just to take them from the floor. You can address them to one or the other, but my experience is you'll get an answer from both anyway. Uh, Oscar Garcia. I'm very favorably impressed with Walden Walgren's remarks, particularly with regard to the National Science Foundation. I'm glad to see that you have such insight 
Uh, there is one point at, at NSF that I want to emphasize. Uh, the, there is quite a bit of emphasis in pre college education, and I would never speak against that, but and that is a necessary but not sufficient activity. Uh, the undergraduate engineering education efforts are totally absent at the present time in, in science and engineering education. There is absolutely nothing, there is not one penny for undergraduate engineering education. So what is happening is we're working in the pre-college area, which is excellent. I think we need that. And then we're working in the research area, and the undergraduate area is totally vacant. And uh, there's another point I wanted to make. There, has, there was a comment yesterday made by Mr. Keyword with regard to a 25% increase in the uh, electrical, computer, and systems engineering division. If I understand it right, I think that budget is about 50 million. Now, it's, we're very grateful, I think, for a 25% increase. We have to worry about 25% of what? Uh, 50 million out of a budget of over a, a billion is a drop in the bucket. So I would like to really ask both of you to comment on the, on the relative percentage, not just of the individual division, but of the total budget, which is the engineering is really very small. Well, uh, first. I just think we ought to receive that comment because I think it's right on the mark. Uh, the, the truth of it is that uh, uh, as a percentage of the overall, many of these efforts are very, very small. And a, and a sizable increase in a small base is a small effort. And, uh, uh, and, and we ought to recognize it as such. And I'm afraid that, that uh, we should not uh, feel particularly good that we see uh, 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 so-called uh, 13 and 20 percent increases in certain efforts, because that can be a very, very diminutive uh, uh, effort. Yeah, I'd just like to comment on the first part of the question. You're absolutely right. The undergraduate engineering programs are underfunded. Uh, my, my feeling is that this is a problem that the private sector can help a great deal in. Uh, the American Electronics Association, the Massachusetts High Technology Council, many of the companies that you may be associated with have recognized that if they don't roll up their sleeves and start to contribute to these uh, programs, they're not going to have any engineers to do the work. And uh, my feeling is that the government, uh, uh, they can provide some help, the, the federal government, the state and local governments, but we, we can also provide stimulus or incentives for the corporations to act in their self-interest and contribute more equipment and more cash and, and work uh, closely in association with the universities. Uh, in my district is a good example of how that can work. At Stanford University, Dean Frederick Terman, for many, many years, established a two-way street between the industry and the university and the uh, engineering school there at Stanford prospered by that but the community and the industry prospered as well. I'm hopeful that we can encourage this kind of uh, uh, industry, uh, university, uh, cross-fertilization as well as whatever government dollars we can channel in there. Yes, uh, the, this may be the last question. Yeah, I'm sure. It's very difficult in an election year to deal with deficits and talk about tax increases, so I don't think you do your job. But you think that Congress has a will to look for the other alternative, which is to reduce spending so we can afford some of these new programs, and do you have any specific ideas where that could occur? Well, we got to do, we got to do both. Uh, anybody who says that the deficits can be reduced substantially either through wishful thinking, that is economic growth, will grow our way out of the problem, or we'll do it all through taxes, or we'll do it all through cutting the defense budget. <coughs> they haven't looked at the numbers. The numbers are so pervasive that, uh, and so large that only uh, cuts across the board and with tax increases can uh, give you the kind of, uh, of uh, reductions you need. 
need. That's why the proposal I made, which is not a, uh, which is no panacea, but essentially saying, let's f see if we can halt the real, real growth in the spending across the board for one year and raise a, a, on a one-year basis a 5% a surcharge uh, on individual income taxes. The cuts would result in about $30 billion in savings, the taxes about $20 billion. That's $50 billion. Very hard to get, but you're not going to get it if you put uh, defense off limits, if you put entitlements off limits. My campaign manager would blanch if, I, if he heard me say that uh, we should be looking at ways of reducing the growth in entitlements, that's like Social Security, Medicare, and so forth, but you got to face up to it. And I think the American people are ready for the truth. They're, 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 they understand that the direction we're going is, uh, is uh, crazy, that in a period of very rapid economic growth, we are uh, expanding the deficits. Uh, if, you, if you look at the numbers right, in a period of expanding economic growth, it, it's a situation that I found in my company. We grew over a year at a very rapid rate and we lost money. And I said there was something wrong. We shouldn't be losing money when we're growing that fast. That's exactly what's happening in the economy today. There's something wrong and it's just because we want to spend so much more on you than we want to tax you. We've got to go through the whole budget. We've got to go through the taxes in an effort to close it. But it's not going to be a simple solution. I think politically, however, in answer to your question, people out there in America understand the problem better than we think they do. And if we wring our hands hands and rail against the deficit, but we don't do anything about it because we think it's politically unpopular, the things we have to do. We may be surprised that it's more politically unpopular to be irresponsible than to take the tough actions that need to be taken. You know, with respect to the deficit, I, I too feel that uh, it is probably more likely to get a major, major down payment on that deficit uh, out of the Congress than it is uh, not likely in an election year because the public basically understands that this is a disastrous course that we're on and, uh, uh, and, and I think the Congress will react to that. Uh, some of the numbers are there. Uh, uh, the, uh, the range of 30 billion or thereabouts uh, uh, was uh, uh, literally agreed on by the House of Representatives in its Ways and Means uh, tax, uh, tax Committee. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and that's a consensus measure. Uh, the only thing that was out of place was the industrial development bonds uh, and, and whether or not uh, what they were to be capped off. Uh, so I think there is a, a substantial potential to get a major, major uh, 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 cut in that uh, projected deficit. What worries me is, is that the deficit may be far worse than, uh, than even uh, uh, administration projections. That's been our history and that's now beginning to be the view of the Congressional Budget Office. And I'm sorry to say, but that uh, that my view of the deficit is that uh, uh, in 1979, the total deficit was $27.8 billion. Now, this country would give its eye teeth to get back to 1979. And, uh, uh, and the truth of it is, we are suffering from the deficit in ways that, uh, uh, that those who think they benefited from the change between 1979 and now would really have a tough time uh, choosing between those two. And uh, I think we have to ask ourselves, what happened between 1979 and 1983 and 1984? Uh, to drive that deficit from $27 billion to $200 billion. And, uh, 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 and you can uh, program it out, and it is largely in terms of, of uh, decreased revenue uh, to the tune of about $80 billion in a 12-month period, and increased defense spending to the tune of, again, approximately $80-some billion in a 12-month period. And that, uh, plus where we started, ties exactly to where we come out. Uh, when you look at government and ask what can be cut, certainly there can be cuts. But the truth of it is we did take quite a substantial reduction, as Mr. Feldstein says. Feldstein, Feldstein speaks, confuse me. But he said that the truth of it is that we actually reduced domestic spending in this government by, I think, uh, an across-the-board 10% of the whole 
and that he described that as a revolution unheard of in American politics. And uh, uh, so, uh, so I really feel that uh, we've got to look at uh, this government spending thing with a little bit of uh, understanding about uh, where this deficit came from. And uh, it hasn't been too long ago that we were within just the marginal deficits that did not threaten the whole economic structure. <clears throat> I think that's all we have time for. The next session begins at 9 o'clock, but uh, as you gentlemen perhaps know, IEEE is celebrating its centennial this year, Century of Electrical Progress, and in, as a memento of this occasion, we want to present each of you with something that may help you also keep on your schedule for your 16-hour days, uh, an IEEE centennial clock. Thank you, I thank you both very much. At this point, let me uh, adjourn the meeting, remind you